Good afternoon, really, uh, our viewers. Uh, hello to all of you. We have 19th Minsk Forum organized by the German Belarus Forum in Berlin. And this is the event that's taking place in Vilnius, Warsaw, and Berlin. Please look at the dates of the event in your own city. And we are under the premises of uh, Amaguru in Vilnius. We have had already several panel discussions, and the topic of the forum today is other topics of cultural identity, political system in Belarus, and issues of independence. And the topic of today actually unites us under one important date, that is the 30th anniversary of independence of the country. And this is the final panel discussion, uh, which is uh, streaming online. And uh, we now will make the conclusions uh, we have been talking about the past, about uh, the present, and now we have a final discussion. Andrei Kazakevich uh, is the director of the Institute of Political Studies, Political Sphere. Vladimir Stapenko is representing the National Anti-Crisis Management, is responsible for multilateral diplomacy, ex-ambassador. And Alexei Kajalski, he is a doctor of philosophy, in, he is at Charles University in Prague, PhD researcher. Thank you very much for joining us in this panel discussion. And as I've told already to our viewers, this is not the first discussion, this is a final discussion in our forum and uh, I'd like again to uh, reiterate the question by Alexander why we need Belarus why Belarus for all of us who is ready to answer who will be the first Alexei maybe you please um, thank you. Thank you uh, for presentation. Uh, I already tried to answer this question before. You know, sometimes people choose not to live in their own country uh, for the reasons not related to political issues or economy. Um, but beside those routine issues uh, uh, and dependence on what is more comfortable for you in terms of culture and, and social, you know, area. Uh, so there are some conservative mechanisms that keep uh, the people in place and then uh, there is also a project, like a project of the future, that is considered to be more attractive. And in Belarus, of course, we have had something that before that was articulated by the uh, government as well, like this uh, stability and also uh, having some certain uh, level of uh, st standard of living and of course many things happened uh, and uh, the government was not able to present the social contract properly and uh, again uh, um, this standard uh, was not enough anymore. This uh, modernization says that in, uh, also the political requirements become higher and higher. Um, and uh, also there is a, a view of the future uh, which says, well, uh, it's cool to be a Belarusian because you know, uh, there is a certain uh, portrait uh, uh, which is close 
to the people. Yes, for the other, please. Your turn, thank you. Sorry, there is no sound. reasons we can not say there is no sound. Now the microphone is on. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so to love Belarus, you have to go to other countries, uh, first of all. And of course, we have the right to create our own home and to build our house in the way uh, that we think it is correct to do it. And in our history, we had different periods when the Belarusian state was prosperous and was considered one of the strongest states in Europe in Middle Ages. And then we didn't have a state uh, at all. And today we have 30 years of our independence. However, unfortunately, we are saying it under, condi under conditions when there are, there are certain dangers um, to that independence. Uh, and uh, there is a long way to go before we can really be independent in considering our own future and establishing our own future. And for the Belarusians, it will be difficult to strengthen the place under the sky. And I believe we still will be able to build that house. Andre, well, we need to answer the question, why we need Belarus? Well, I cannot answer this question because, you know, there is a question, why you need money, for instance? And perhaps it's stupid to, to ask the economists uh, such a question. Well, when this issue is uh, actually solved, then you don't ask the economist about that. No, well, no, when we discuss about the Belarus, what kind of Belarus uh, should be, why we need Belarus, generally speaking, uh, I don't know even how to address this issue. Mm, well, maybe just, you know, uh, have, by having fun. Well, logically speaking, well, why we need Belarus? Why we need to build Belarus? Why we need to pay attention to this topic in the first place? Well, well, no, why? Can we just change Belarus to another country, just leaving Belarus, for instance, rationally speaking, and still we are Belarusians? Well, most probably we don't need Belarus, we don't need Belarus at all. Uh, there are places like New York and Melbourne and other places like that. I really don't know. I believe that the question like that is most probably not related to real life. Okay, thank you very much for your opinion. And uh, this is uh, the discussion that we have, and we'd like to show different opinions. Okay, the topic of our discussion is on the road to the new Belarus. What it will look like, and when we uh, have uh, something like uh, certain time, and when we think about what kind of 
Belarus we will have and what is the road for new Belarus. So let's have a strategy that we put ourselves in the point when we have this new Belarus and then we will talk about the characteristics, what kind of resources we need on this road and what kind of um, things we need to achieve it. One of the aspects is the aspect of independence. In the new Belarus, the issue of independence and Belarus uh, from the perspective of independence, what kind of Belarus that could be? Andrei, let's start with you. You have the microphone, right? Okay. First of all, I don't think that there is a danger to Belarusian uh, sovereignty and independence. Uh, the argument is simple. How many countries stopped uh, uh, to exist after Second World War? Most probably there are no examples like this. What about new countries? Well, there are uh, dozens of those. There are more and more countries. Uh, the, the certain countries become smaller and smaller. And Belarus is similarly going on that way and basically how can we actually build this sovereignty? What can we do about it? And, we, and nobody needs it apart from ourselves. Yeah, there are some comments. Well, and I think the state of Belarus uh, will exist as long as the Belarusians themselves need it. And nobody will basically uh, fight against the Belarusian sovereignty. Of course, uh, there are some external influences and uh, that will stay, but the question of sovereignty and independence, uh, this is done and solved uh, for centuries ago. Well, this is the question concerning the history of Belarus. It's about its centralist direction. What about the influences from Russia, let's say, from the EU side and so on? Yes, of course, uh, the zone of interest of Russia, that is important, as long as it is interesting for Russia. Uh, if we have an analogy how the empires dis were dissolved and terminated in the 20th century, uh, if the center is ready to invest in peripheries uh, financially or any other resources, then the situation uh, can be uh, remaining the same. And there are many influences in Belarus. It's not only Lukashenko, it's economy. We have half of our turnover with Russia. Uh, and there is no other country in the world uh, and uh, in the post-Soviet space uh, around 10 20 percent yeah, there are certain influences through elite through education and so on and uh, social things more than anything else and don't see any other mechanisms that would allow to eliminate this question totally and uh, also it's important to see uh, 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 to see what kind of relations uh, Russia will have with the European Union mm, and if they become better most probably we'll have better relations also with Europe and with the West in general unfortunately also Uh, a lot will depend on the Belarusians themselves. There are too many factors, external factors primarily, that would not allow uh, to change at will our orientation and direction. And the whole population is oriented 
um, not to change the geopolitical orientation and it's a really quite stable situation sociologically and last 20 years the main tendency was uh, just uh, some people were increasing their illusionist views and there was no serious dynamics uh, of a serious or more serious euro integration in the direction of that integration so speaking about the future is there a chance that we can strengthen our neutrality the position of neutrality in geopolitical sense for the population or as you said in terms of isolation or neutrality in terms of geopolitical direction of Belarus well neutrality yes it's a bit different problem I believe that here everything will depend on uh, how much the Belarus and its uh, elite will want themselves if the Belarusian elite would like to have the neutral state in this status from uh, 1990 uh, there were windows of opportunity to realize uh, it but they didn't use the opportunity for the reasons uh, that are well known mm, but if we uh, wait uh, and look for such opportunities it could be achieved for Belarus it could be most probably the optimal option to uh, reach certain level of neutrality uh, and to go away from uh, any links, strong links uh, to either Russia or the EU or the United States. But we need to work a lot in this direction, and there is no consensus so far in the Belarusian elite on this issue. Thank you, Andre, Alexeyna. What about you? What do you think? about what we can do today so that we can change the status of sovereignty of Belarus in the future and how you see that status in the future. I have two remarks. First, the conceptual one. We are speaking about the sovereignty, but uh, it's difficult to understand. There are theorists in uh, international relations. Stephen Creston, for example, have uh, analyzed it, and he's speaking about several aspects of sovereignty. There is a formal sovereignty, and uh, there is a factual one. For example, the ability to control movement of information, capital assets, uh, people through the borders, and uh, nobody has it in nowadays world. There is also so uh, inner sovereignty, the ability to control what is uh, going on inside your boundaries. And there are countries with formal sovereignty, for example, Libya, being accepted by everyone, but they do not have the inner sovereignty. They, it, it is, uh, in English, uh, we would call it a failed state. So we need to understand what we're talking about if we're speaking about sovereignty. This is the first thing. Neutrality. And how to depict it in future, I cannot uh, forecast here. Because I'm not an expert. I'm from the academic um, environment and we do not uh, uh, feel well uh, about uh, the uh, forecasters. Uh, but I think it's important to understand that uh, there is a lot of uncertainty when we are speaking about uh, neutrality. And I agree with uh, Andrei that there are several uh, inner political factors that in this or that way 
make it make this way quite problematic as for example now we're in Lithuania for example the Baltic states um, have uh, walked this path in the 90s and uh, they were focusing on coming back to Europe but the Baltic states were not <coughs> even in one regional initiative were not involved that Russia has promoted. But Ukraine, for example, signed a lot of uh, different agreements uh, and contracts, uh, although uh, many think that uh, Ukraine was uh, separate from Russia, but uh, it's not true. Kravchuk, for example, signed uh, the declaration. But neutrality is such a thing that for which we need uh, uh, Factual uh, circumstances. For example, Switzerland. Switzerland is really a neutral country, unlike Belarus. It uh, is not involved neither economically nor uh, in the military arena. But there is such a thing as geography. Also, cultural, economic, political issues. One Slovak commentator said that if you want uh, Switzerland uh, in Slovakia, but uh, in uh, Slovakia we don't have enough uh, Swiss to make it uh, Switzerland. So uh, to broaden up the horizons, uh, political horizons, and to look uh, at uh, the historical neutrality, for example, Belgians. Okay, we can... Uh, have an opinion that Switzerland is uh, great, uh, but uh, neutrality uh, has been uh, uh, quite uh, has had quite a notorious uh, result uh, in the past for some countries and some nations. So that also has uh, to be taken into consideration. So concept. Uh, that, so it's not only Swiss uh, uh, experience that we have on neutrality. There are different other stories and examples. If you are in, in a certain geopolitical zone, geopolitical area, although I don't like this uh, term, as one Czech uh, author said, this idea of the bridge uh, between the East and West, it is not good to be a bridge because Uh, oh, excuse my Russian today, because uh, bridge is being used and uh, people march uh, on the bridges uh, uh, using their boots. Uh. Thank you, Alexei. So Alexei doesn't like forecasting. Let's ask Vladimir. What uh, is your vision of sovereignty of Belarus in future and what can we do today and what other subjects, other stakeholders can do in order to reach this point that you might foresee? I would be very happy. I would be extremely happy to see that uh, nothing threatens the sovereignty of Belarus. Today we can speak theoretically about many things about sovereignty also, or how is it is formed, what are the components of sovereignty, and we know that integration processes uh, in general uh, mean limitations or self-limitations of uh, sovereignty when the state uh, consciously voluntarily gives uh, some uh, part of its sovereignty on to the national level and uh, to the level of international organizations and uh, um, they also obliged to uh, uh, work together with these international organizations uh, and uh, obey the rules and uh, here we have the example of the European Union and it's not uh, that uh, simple how this uh, uh, European Union was formed uh, how the relations uh, and balance uh, and uh, decision making in the European Union was uh, uh, developed uh, and uh, the qualified majority uh, on the many issues, the unified opinion on also many sensitive issues. 
So again, uh, the union uh, state, uh, for example, yesterday we know that uh, uh, roadmaps uh, have uh, been uh, uh, first drafted but now uh, accepted and nobody has seen them, but uh, now, well, as we know, they have been published, so most probably we are going to read them and uh, look through and uh, again see uh, that neither sovereignty uh, of uh, Belarus, uh, no identity is not threatened. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I, hardly, I can hardly imagine this mechanism of decision-making, balanced decision-making in the framework of international organization where there are only two states uh, and uh, one of them 95% uh, on all uh, economic and other factors uh, covers all uh, the uh, spheres. Uh, and another one has only 5%. And these are two states. And uh, But still, uh, this uh, uh, state that has only 5% uh, um, says that it's sovereign. Of course, if it's unilateral uh, agreements and uh, decision-making process, yes, then uh, the small country can defend itself. But if it's international secre secretariat and international organizations, then the sovereign uh, uh, abilities uh, come into a different light. I understand that uh, the 30, during the 30, these 30 years uh, uh, didn't uh, uh, pass uh, to no avail and um, Belarus was following uh, its, uh, uh, we could say, uh, its vector, its uh, um, main vector, and uh, the last 25 years, unfortunately, didn't uh, show the progress uh, that we counted on. Most probably, these were years of stagnation and maybe recession, but anyways, in any case, these 30 years uh, let a new generation of Belarusians uh, grow the post-Soviet generation, people who perceive Belarus not as uh, some empty sound, not as Western uh, uh, region of a big Russian world, but they perceive Belarus as their house, their home, the national state uh, where we as uh, Belarusians uh, have the right uh, for our identity and self-identification. So yes, we can say that it, we have been successful in this, but uh, in the nearest future, I think uh, this new generation might take effort and uh, uh, when the effort is made then it uh, can be uh, all these processes uh, uh, and system can be fortified uh, in the in sphere of uh, sovereignty. Thank you Vladimir. Andre, do you have anything to add? Yes. Uh, I want to speak about the vision about what kind of Belarus we might have in future and in the, in the international uh, light and arena. So most probably I have several concepts. Uh, the first uh, is for post, um, which uh, means that if uh, it's either uh, east or west, uh, most probably it's uh, east, and Lukashenko has been uh, speaking about the eastern vector a lot, uh, but most probably it's not the best variant. Another is uh, the bridge metaphor, uh, which um, has also been mentioned. So Belarus as a bridge uh, between uh, uh, the two, so there is some movement through that bridge. Again, we have only two sort of two shores that uh, we can connect. Again, most probably this is not the best uh, variant uh, because uh, the contacts uh, between the two centers, uh, uh, the the the. They can be just direct and we do not need the bridge, but also there can be a metaphor <coughs> of a hub when we, we might be acting as like sort of a bridge, but actually as a platform where very flexible communications between different regions of the world can happen. Most probably for Belarus, the uh, formation of this regional hub and international relations would be optimal. Um, um, Solution. I don't know if uh, we can make it, but uh, we strive for it, and that would be good. Can you comment what subjects uh, and have to act and in what way so that we reach this vision? As I have mentioned first, what has to be done is... Uh, as a result of uh, inner discussion and inner dialogue, we have to reach consensus so that we understand where we're going. 
the mainstream needs to be formed according to this idea. That means uh, mm, we do not have to go extreme. Are we turning to the east or to the west? Are we transit? Are uh, we the bridge between the first and the second? First of all, we need to change our understanding and approach, understanding of what is our place in this region. Unfortunately, uh, sadly, if we take nowadays discussions, political discussions, yes, this is the paradigm. Uh, we are somewhere uh, on the break, or we are a bridge where some um, uh, changing uh, point. Uh, if we don't have our own identity and we do not uh, strive for, to uh, call it this way, nobody will arrange it for us. So first it's consolidation. And next we need to wait uh, and use every opportunity to step by step uh, form this concept <coughs> or bring this concept uh, in the, to, into this region and seek for it to happen. Thank you. It's a very interesting idea. Next topic is uh, state management, state system what it should be, how should it look like in future, how can we reach it. And most probably the first expert uh, uh, to talk on this topic is Vladimir, uh, because uh, Vladimir has been involved in this system mostly. Uh, how do you see it? Uh, most probably today I represent uh, the system of the old generation, although we had a very nice uh, dialogue and uh, a fruitful discussion about uh, how it could be organized uh, in a new way. We have come to a conclusion that uh, due to uh, certain uh, circumstances we do not uh, see the break uh, in elite uh, on the background of the political processes that have been taking place uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in last year in Belarus uh, due to the um, results of the elections. And uh, all in all, uh, the uh, state uh, management uh, is authoritarian in Belarus at the moment. It's very very regime and uh, it's only one way connection which excludes uh, any uh, smart initiatives uh, and any uh, dialogue uh, and uh, any um, uh, flexible uh, reaction or solutions to new facts new arguments new uh, challenges but at the same time we can see that all in all in uh, uh, the statehood of uh, Belarus uh, at the moment, there is potential and experience and discipline uh, that uh, international experts uh, also uh, see and uh, the system can work uh, in an effective manner. Um, most probably uh, the most important task for the future is uh, to change um, uh, this, uh, uh, not the system itself, but how it works, uh, and uh, to use the potential of those uh, state uh, uh, officials uh, uh, who uh, still have, uh, who haven't violated human rights uh, in Belarus, who haven't taken part in repressions, and uh, uh, we might uh, retune, reboot uh, this system adapted to new uh, rules uh, and uh, on this basis we can then uh, build a new Belarus. What characteristics um, would be absolutely new from the ones that we have today. System-wise, management-wise, I would start from following the rules, following the legal system, uh, operating within the legal framework, uh, and um, it, uh, the system does not have to uh, be meant for one person only. It, ha it is meant uh, uh, as a service for all the people, all the citizens. Uh, and uh, in this way, it can uh, uh, develop sustainable, uh, sus in a sustainable way, uh, not withstanding the political changes that might uh, happen uh, in, in the authority. It is very important that the state has such a tool which uh, ensures uh, operation of all areas uh, in the country, notwithstanding, one more time I'm uh, saying it, uh, uh, or, or on, of the 
uh, some decisions made uh, in by the authorities. So if uh, the citizen A, citizen B, or citizen L uh, uh, suddenly quits, then everything is destroyed. We do not. We cannot even have this kind of approach. If the citizen A, B, or L quits tomorrow, all the functions of the state need to keep operating, and the system has to be sustainable. And the system does not have to depend on the whim of uh, uh, some uh, individuals, and this is how it should be reformed. Thank you, Vladimir. Alexei, you do not like forecasting. But as an uh, academic, maybe you can discuss with me and analyze best practices. Vladimir has been mentioning best practices, best uh, world practices that we can implement uh, for the state system. How do you see the effective state system that can be implemented in Belarus? I do not like speaking about something I uh, know nothing about and where I'm not an expert, since I'm not an uh, expert in uh, uh, public uh, administration. This is a separate uh, area, separate field, a separate discipline, research on uh, public administration. Although public and state are different things. I think And not everyone uh, feels the difference. To my mind, most probably, I trust the experts who say that uh, if we compare uh, these processes with Ukraine that has been mentioned today too in the morning, the quality and uh, the uh, state uh, capacity of decision making within the state is quite high in uh, Belarus. Of course, we also have the term state quality. This might be more difficult and uh, not as uh, good. But uh, state capacity is uh, there for sure. I also would like to add, but I'm non-professional in this case, that very often this is associated, uh, this effectiveness uh, of uh, public administration is associate, associated with uh, uh, the individual, with uh, Lukashenko, who is saying that we need to be harsh, we need to do it in this harsh way. But. These are issues related to a broader context. This is labor ethics. And uh, role-based behavior. When you rule-based uh, behavior, when you act uh, according to the rules, and this is a very broad uh, social context, and not even one uh, uh, authority, a uh, leader can change it. Uh, for example, from you in Singapore, he has been uh, mentioning that uh, I cannot build Singapore in Africa because they have a different labor ethics, and uh, the role of the individual, one individual, uh, however strong the political figure he might be, uh, it's, it's, it cannot <coughs> build it all alone and we need to talk about it and in future uh, we have to understand that this role of one person cannot be as uh, huge as, as it is now. Thank you Alexei. Andrei, we are going to ask you what is your vision of the uh, uh, state uh, system. Maybe I would like to speak about higher level, constitutional, political um, system. I think that uh, uh, authoritarian uh, regime in uh, uh, Belarus uh, he has had, uh, everybody has had enough of this authoritarian uh, regime and um, it doesn't, sometimes, uh, 
Um, it is purposeful to fight for this uh, and to protect this regime, but there are three main uh, theses. Uh, authoritarian model can form the state uh, and uh, can, uh, so the state building can emerge from it, or the economy also can uh, emerge uh, from it or can be developed uh, by using it. In Belarus, uh, state institutes are already, uh, have already been created, they already exist, uh, so we do not need to compare it with Africa or Latin America of uh, the 60s, the 70s, and so on. This uh, issue is uh, solved. Na nation building. In this uh, sphere, we have the same uh, uh, situation. Authoritarian regime didn't bring anything to the table in na nation building uh, uh, area. And I think uh, it was uh, nation building was uh, forming and building its capacity not uh, uh, not due to authoritarian regime, uh, but notwithstanding the fact that it existed. And um, if we look at Russia, authoritarian uh, or this authority is uh, handling these issues and solving the problems without us assessing if it's good or bad. The state uh, can also uh, want to create an empire and then again we need uh, authoritarian approach. Uh, so the gun, uh, Putin, uh, they in the in nowadays world they can do it and they do it but uh, Belarus uh, doesn't uh, aim at it. Uh, so then again we don't need authoritarian approach. And next uh, economy, economic growth uh, and uh, here uh, South, uh, speaking about South Korea of several periods, uh, Singapore um, South, uh, West, uh, Southeastern um, uh, uh, Asia. Again, speaking about this authoritarian uh, approach, which can solve uh, problems on the market, can solve economic problems, can ensure stable, uh, sustainable economic growth. But we can see that even this function is not uh, functional in Belarus. Uh, and uh, by in the past 25 years, we have uh, a stagnation period economic-wise too. And uh, authoritarian regime cannot uh, solve this problem and is not proposing anything. How to tackle it or how to solve it so it's not even developing so all arguments for uh, uh, authoritarian regime in the Belarus and for keeping it uh, they don't work we need to shift to the democratic approach and uh, of course uh, this uh, Apart from this authoritarian discourse, we have a very broad democratic uh, uh, consensus and it has to be parliamentary presidential uh, state. Nobody wants presidential uh, or president-based uh, state uh, anymore. This is how I would see uh, the future of Belarus. Uh, of course, uh, maybe we can um, uh, discuss some details, but I think that would be best for na nation building, uh, state building and for economic the growth. Thank you. Uh, what is the role of uh, technologies in the state uh, system in uh, public administration? What can it be? Same as in other countries. It's uh, difficult to think of something. It's difficult to create something new. Uh, what uh, about uh, electronic uh, uh, state management and its uh, um, role? Yes, in Belarus we have uh, good uh, opportunities uh, to implement it uh, more uh, often and wider than it is uh, now and it can be a base of uh, state. What model can we take? Maybe a stone model um, could be an example. I don't know uh, in detail how much of it can be implemented in Belarus, but uh, from our region this is a good example, Estonia, which we could take as a basis. Thank you. And uh, now we can see that you actually built a bridge to our next topic when you mentioned Estonia. So about the future of Belarusian identity, 
identity in the future. So before we go to this topic, I'd like to address our audience and say that you can leave your comments and your queries uh, and uh, we will uh, read it to our panelists. So please write your comments. So we start with Alexei now first. Uh, how do you see the, the Belarusian and then identity and all the narratives that are related uh, to uh, this concept uh, for the future? Yes, now it's working, thank you. Uh, that's a question for the whole lecture, you know. Well, we have time, and you can tell us something. Well, it's difficult to make any prognosis, because uh, there are certain things happening that nobody can predict. Uh, and uh, this is our... Uh, topic of today also. In the previous panel I was also saying uh, that these processes are spontaneous sometimes. Uh, uh, also to mention the rhetoric of these protests in Belarus when there was a recommendation of uh, symbolic heritage uh, mixed with uh, myths of the partisans and so on. So all the you know diversity of symbolic resources there. And I believe that uh, this will continue. Uh, coexisting, coexistence of different narratives, the narratives of Belarusian national revival uh, and uh, especially of pre-Soviet references uh, uh, together with the Great Patriotic War uh, that is uh, the Second World War in the Soviet Union and the symbols still are meaningful and they are changing the meanings this is like a stream no, no, where we have the signifiers uh, no, that are floating and uh, they're changing their places and there is a resignification happening in that stream. Uh, a good example is, you know, of this national flag, uh, white, red and white flag for many it was uh, the flag of the National Front of Belarus and uh, it's related to national identity the idea of uh, the Belarusian national ethnocultural revival uh, it, so it was uh, uh, like the heritage of the uh, great Duchy of Lithuania, but an interesting thing happened that these colors of white, red and white were also taken over by the people who were primarily Russian spoken. Of course they know about the great Duchy of Lithuania from the textbooks. And uh, they know how the nation building was made. Of course, it was uh, significant. However, uh, in the protests, uh, th these points were actually political, not cultural. And then we saw, uh, you know, the new um, shifts of these symbols. And I believe that we will see like that in the future, and we will have eventually the hybrid where we can find uh, different things, uh, different things, and that would even beyond the expectations of uh, analysts like myself. 
very interesting, Alexei. And uh, after you mentioned the Soviet symbols and Soviet identity, well, cultural references, uh, this is what I meant. Uh, we have another creation and identities and symbols that are related to the regime of today. What is their place within uh, this pot of identity? Will they be related to the Soviet times or they will be called, you know, the Lukashistic, like Lukashenko symbols? How do you see it? Or maybe there will be a melting of these symbols and they will not have any form at all? This Soviet Well, look, uh, the Soviet... Soviet in 10 years will be 40 years of independence. Yes, this is what uh, I'm saying. You know, as I said, 30 years ago, it was in the 70s. Well, we're becoming older, but you know, the anything Soviet for someone is a golden age. For others, it's you know, just you know, very grim times. And so. Uh, these are things that are very symbolic. So, uh, I believe, most probably there will be a kind of a new Soviet renaissance mm, mm, uh, among the young people, some no nostalgic feelings uh, towards the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union. I just had a discussion with one person who uh, was saying that it was beautiful times in the socialism and the state was taking care of me and so on and so on. It was like a phantom nostalgia. I think something similar will happen to Project Lukashenko. Maybe it will be kind of a renaissance of this political project and will be more and more marginal. Maybe it will attract the people who really have not lived under Lukashenko. Well, you know, it was good under Lukashenko. Well, people like sometimes to say that it was good uh, under something, uh, under somebody, uh, yes, uh, some people are idealizing Russian Empire, the Russia that we lost, uh, you know, like in the movie, the Siberian Barber and so on. Yeah, you, know, you were talking a lot about the young people, new generation that's grown today. In your understanding, uh, what about the Belarusian identity? How it will look like in the future? What are its narratives? In my understanding, uh, the youth will retain its identity and strengthen it and uh, its, its mission uh, exactly in that. And when we look back, uh, we as both Soviet generation have showed to the new generation really the legal task when after three referendums we have changed drastically the constitution of Belarus and now we are thinking hard how to get out of this situation when we understand clearly that we cannot go on living with such constitution we cannot pass it over to next generations and the people don't want to live anymore under all such autocratic regime that doesn't give them anything and of course it was difficult for the new generations to clean those tables and of course one of the decisions made was uh, the equality of 
the Russian and the Russian languages that in practice uh, tend into the domination of Russian language. So today we can say for the revival of the Belarusian language which is actively still used by many people and has not disappeared from our agenda, we need to have additional efforts to be put into its uh, real revival and we need uh, social and civil actions and efforts to be put into it uh, to present maximally comfortable situations and circumstances for further development of the Belarusian language. And of course the identity will also include the national symbols. And I believe that this choice has been made already. I also remember the referendum of 1995 which without any big discussions has changed the national symbols into post-Soviet symbols. As I understand that the national symbols had a centuries old history and so post-Soviet symbols don't have any symbols and the present Belarusian symbols don't have any history behind them. And a month after the referendum, I was present at the football match between Belarus and uh, Holland, and the Belarusian team won, one to zero. And of course, that was big celebration. So also the symbols are important in that respect. What would happen to the post-Soviet symbols? I believe it will be just, you know, the on the display in the museums of mm, the Lukashenko times. Mm, and mm, then the new Belarus future will be formed by the Belarus people. About the identity, I'm very skeptical about the Belarusian Soviet identity. In the previous session, we discussed it. that uh, is related to the Soviet nation and so on uh, and that uh, was about the 1990s and 2000s so today we have a different direction Lukashenko had a chance to create new Belarusian identity on the basis of a new state and that was a complete failure why? because there was no new Belarusian pantheon made everything was made on the Soviet basis and nothing really uh, considerable, considerably uh, fundamental. Well, let's say there will be uh, a program at the university uh, about the Second World War and it will be about the Soviet people. Well, uh, in the political sense, of course, it was okay, but later the category of the Soviet people has become abstract. Uh, and that was something that, you know, was existing at some time, but nothing emotionally important. So this identity, I believe, uh, will be in the highlight. Uh, we can uh, speak about uh, ethno-linguistic uh, meaning, uh, uh, but um, we have these expressions about uh, the Belarusian language um, and 
here to depend about the citizenship, a Belarusian citizen, citizenship, uh, and some synthesis between Soviet identity, the Russian identity, and cultural identity, uh, and some peripheral discourses. Um, but the mainstream will be a synthesis, yeah, and the. Uh, 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 only authoritarian regime was hindering this type of development. And these discourses, in fact, of uh, history and Soviet history are not in conflict over the Belarusian identity. They could be easily integrated. There are lots of examples of that and many discussions of historians were going on about that. Of course, we had the anti-Soviet partisan movement and there were people who were, uh, you know, fighting against them. It's difficult to come to terms with, with these two sides. And in Belarus, we can put them together, you know. Uh, there were no direct conflict of those sides. Uh, and there is no conflict like the club, uh, like we're called, uh, that, like we call collaborators and the Soviet partisans. Uh, in the Soviet uh, history in the last 20 years, if we look how it's written by the Academy of Science, most probably it's going backwards. However, uh, as soon as administrative methods will be weakened, the, the synthesis will take place, and then the national identity uh, will be also synthesized. And uh, the, yeah, I don't think there is a power now in the regions that would uh, take and assimilate these things among themselves. Well, Andre, we have another question, but Alex, I wanted to add something before that. Okay, we still have some time, so maybe you can put in some comments. Okay, then quickly, but slowly speaking. Yeah. I believe that you underestimate the level of of the Lukashenko project. He really uh, he took over, you know, the Soviet symbols uh, from the Soviet Union war times, like the Great Patriot war it was called here and the Soviet people it was abstract yes no uh, new ideological expression uh, and, uh, of course and then uh, the Soviet Union was integrated then we can say there was no such uh, ideological expression well uh, there is an idea of the empire, empire to be, you know, also taken over and we have this uh, heritage, um, you know, and the Bulgarians and everybody else were like uh, the ears of the Russian Empire, of course. And uh, we can see that this is a kind of historical construction. And I, well, something like that, very shortly, uh, as far as these other people are concerned. It was working at the time when people really were understanding it on the emotional level. They were part of the Soviet Union and uh, they remembered everything as a part of their identity. But uh, in time it stopped working and uh, of course I have my own arguments about it. Yeah, but uh, today we can see uh, 
that people don't understand it anymore. And um, Lukashenko cannot also present it like certain good idea. If you could understand it like the partisans, like a part of national identity of the war times, and he could play around it with the several people, then it, it could be like a continuation of the approach towards the war. So, number two, as far as the war is concerned, uh, the Second World War uh, is not in, in conflict with national narrative. We don't have a very strong anti-Soviet narrative related to the Second World War. If we look even at the mainstream, mainstream of uh, the Belarusian um, historiography, uh, the main thing is that, okay, the Soviet partisans were fighting the Germans, that's okay. And so the synthesis already has happened. Uh, and uh, the government today are saying that, look, these were collaborators. And we know that uh, the collaborators are not liked by anybody. Uh, we and don't know even any historians who glorify such people. So basically, uh, the synth synthesis has all the arguments for taking place and to be integrated into the national synthetic discourse. Thank you, Andre. Just another short question. Maybe to Andre, because you mentioned the Estonian example. And today, any person in the world can become an Estonian citizen. Do you, can, do you think that in the future in Belarus, we may have such situation that any person in the world, by remote mode, could become the citizens of Belarus? Because we were talking about the international hub concept, so within this context. Okay, I'm talking about the big scale. Well, in Estonia, maybe two, three, ten, maybe maximum 20 percent of the people electronically might become citizens. But if the quantity will come to 30 percent then the Estonians will take it as a problem and then they will stop this process like in the Soviet times there was Russian immigration when it has reached more than 20 percent, it was a problem uh, because the Estonians could have been in the minority in their own country. So, well, let's say, okay, one million more will become citizens of Belarus and somewhat they will be integrated by coming to Belarus or whatever. But uh, the core of the nation will be still uh, the citizens of Belarus. So, um, so I don't think the majority will be those who will become citizens by electronic means. I am very skeptical about that. Uh, and uh, this is not uh, the, really the model of a national identity. So nation building still will be the center of the people that are within the nation itself. So thank you very much. Now we will take the questions and comments from the audience. Yes, please.
Может быть, комментарии к выступлению? Maybe you have any comments meant for the speakers, for the panelists. Тогда у меня есть один вопрос, тоже очень коротко. Then I have a question. We have seven minutes left. The question is a bit complex. What mistakes throughout the history, maybe Belarusian history or international history, should be focused on and given attention to, so that we do not make these mistakes again in the, the future of Belarus? What can we extract from the history? I have already answered this uh, question uh, during the uh, panel, during the day. I think three referendums um, in uh, 1995, 1996 and 2004 initiated by Lukashenko in the essence uh, have brought uh, Belarus uh, uh, to a cul-de-sac and uh, we are where we are today and uh, the detailed analysis of the results of each of the referendums uh, shows how step by step we uh, came to this point of um, uh, uh, a dead end and uh, these are the mistakes that we need to analyze and not repeat them and of course we can solve it also only by initiating a referendum but it has to be transparent honest and open dialogue with the uh, nation and it has to be informed choice of people and conscious choice of people about the development of our country. Alexei, maybe you have uh, any story that is uh, that goes back in time? No, thank you. Andrei, mm. Mistakes. It might be uh, mistake international uh, uh, history or Russia. Something. What was happening in the past and what we shouldn't do again. If we take the Belarusian uh, experience of the past 30 years and if we focus on it, of course, the power cannot be concentrated in the hands of one person, one individual, and think that uh, it can lead to success. Sometimes it does, but uh, the majority of cases show that there are more problems uh, than solutions, and we can see it now. We can also argue if it's good that uh, um, Lukashenko came to power and was staying uh, there uh, during the year 2000 or 1990s, uh, but uh, uh, it's uh, not easy now to discuss it and uh, it's difficult now to get rid of it. So we shouldn't be doing it again and uh, the state management has to be more complex uh, and it has to be ruled by majority at its best case scenario. Next, I think that we shouldn't be naive and think that without a strong social identity we can build a state uh, and uh, uh, a dynamic economy. This is illusion that uh, was uh, very, uh, uh, very widespread in Belarus in the 90s when everything uh, just started uh, to a less extent in the 2000 uh, and uh, it didn't work. Still, we found ourselves in the situation that the question of identity, national unity, common national aims, uh, integration, uh, uh, this uh, is still the issue. It's important and if uh, uh, we don't reflect on history, uh, it uh, is going to slow down the processes of state uh, building and econo economy development. Thank you, Andrei.
Thank you, Vladimir. Thank you, Alexei. Thank you, all of you viewers, uh, for watching us, for listening to us. Uh, uh, keep uh, uh, looking at uh, our news of uh, Minsk Forum. Have a good evening. Take care.